Have you ever waded through a silence or a darkness so thick and deep that you just knew, you just knew you weren't ever going to emerge the same. You were going to be different when you came out on the other side of it. In December, we march our way toward the winter solstice. The days grow darker and shorter, and in some parts of the world, in some parts even here of our own country, the world also, also goes quieter. Maybe not so much here in Florida, but in parts of the world it grows quieter, right? Because this blanket of snow comes and provides this layer of insulation over the ground. And some of us find these seasons of darkness and silence, we find them heavy and dreary, depressingly so, perhaps even fearfully so. Because you know what happens, right, when it gets quiet and dark? Our own thoughts, right, what happens to them? What happens to our own thoughts? What? They can get dark, they can get loud, <laughs> right? Yeah, they can start to, to swirl around us with these shadows of guilt or grief, shame or anger, lament or despair. And you know, perhaps that's why in nearly every culture, every religious tradition, there is some sort of festival of light that happens at this time of year. I remember my daughter Joelle learning about all the various traditions of festivals of light at this time of year. Because we humans, we tend to not linger in the darkness. We're so eager to brighten the darkness. It's uncomfortable for us to sit there. But the spiritually mature among us, friends, they have discovered that the gift of this season, it isn't just the light that shines in the darkness, but it's also the darkness itself. There is, if we allow it, this womb-like, growing, challenging, peaceful beauty to the darkness, to the quiet of this season. And it can, if we allow it, cocoon us and heal us and challenge us and even rebirth us into something new. And perhaps there's no Christmas character more familiar with the rebirthing power of silence and darkness than Zechariah. And if you're wondering who that is, you're not alone, I guarantee you. He's one of the lesser known characters in the Christmas story. And his story goes like this. There was once a priest named Zechariah who was serving in the days of King Herod of Judea. Now, in case your biblical history is a little bit rusty, let me translate that. There was once a religious leader serving his people during the time when a corrupt tyrant ruled the land and was enforcing the oppression of his people on behalf of a power-hungry empire. And you know what? As much as the world around him and all the politics around him must have looked bleak, it also looked bleak at home for Zechariah. Because you see, despite living an upright and devout and faithful life, both he and his wife, they had grown old without being able to have any children, and they desperately wanted them. Now, as a religious leader myself, I feel for Zechariah because I know from experience how hard it is to hold out hope to your people, to be that hope bearer when the forces around you and sometimes even within you are wearing you down, making life look bleak. Well, thankfully, for Zechariah, he only had to serve two weeks out of the whole year as priest. And this was one of them. And you know, perhaps he was thinking as he went into that week, I'll just, I'll just keep my head down. I'll just serve quietly, go about my priestly duties. Maybe he was praying that he could go to church 
and someone else would fill him up with that hope that he so craved, that hope that he needed, that hope that he couldn't quite seem to reach on his own. But they had this custom. You see, they always, the priests, rolled dice to see which one among them was going to go into the inner sanctuary, into the holiest of places and offer incense to God. And the dice, well, they landed on Zechariah. Thrust front and center, he complied. He entered that holy place. He stepped onto that holiest of ground while a whole crowd of God's people were gathered outside around that holy place praying. And who knows if it was those intercessory prayers or the longings of Zechariah's own heart or simply God's love for Zechariah. But something happened. Something happened to him there in the dark and the silence of that holy place when in despair Zechariah drew close to God. You see, God also drew close to Zechariah there. And an angel, a messenger of God, appeared to him. And at first, Zechariah had the reaction that people usually have to angels, to messengers of God, pure terror. But the angel told him, as angels often do, don't fear, it's okay, don't fear. The messenger let him know that his prayer had been heard, that his wife Elizabeth was going to conceive and bear a child, a son that Zechariah was to name John. And the angel told Zechariah that this child would become his joy and delight, and not only that, but that this child would re restore many people's hope because he would prepare them for God. Well, I don't know how you would respond to that kind of news. Zechariah perhaps should have been giddy with joy. But do you remember his infertile forebears before him, Abraham and Sarah, laughing at God when God told them they would have a child? Well, Zechariah sort of followed in the steps of his forebears. He didn't laugh at God, but he did question God's messenger. How can this be? We are too old to have children. And the angel, a little bit indignant, but still gentle, reminded Zechariah that this good news that he was sharing with him, it came directly from God. And then the messenger told Zechariah, because you didn't trust my message, you will be mute. You will be unable to speak until these things I have foretold come to pass. Well, you remember that there was that crowd outside that holy place, praying and praying? They had started to wonder what in the world had happened to Zechariah, because he'd been in there a long time. When Zechariah finally emerged, he was unable to speak. He could only make signs with his hands to them, and they realized that he must have had some sort of vision while he was in there. Well, that week of Zechariah's priestly duties, they came to an end. He went home. And for nine months, as Elizabeth's belly grew and stretched with this new life that was full of so much hope, for those nine months, Zechariah couldn't utter a sound. He couldn't tell his wife about this amazing promise. He remained mute. When Elizabeth herself discovered that she was pregnant, she actually herself voluntarily went into seclusion for five months. Not because she was questioning God, but because she wanted that time of silence and solitude to be able to thank God properly and prepare herself properly for this immense blessing, this answered prayer that was coming into her life. When the time came for Elizabeth to deliver, she gave birth to a son. And her whole community 
came around her and her family to celebrate with her. Now it was the tradition for a father to name his child, but of course, Zechariah couldn't speak. So the community was going to name the child for him. And they figured a safe bet was Zechariah Jr. But Elizabeth, the boy's mother, she spoke up and told them, no, his name is John. And as so often happens to women with a word from God, no one believed her. They wanted to know the man's opinion. They made signs to Zechariah trying to find out, is this really the boy's name? And you know what? Zechariah did something wonderful. He didn't contradict his wife. Instead, he motioned for a writing tablet, and when he was given to, it, it was given to him, he wrote down the exact words his wife had just said. His name is John. Now, they shouldn't have needed a man to say it. Should have been enough for his mother to tell them the name. But perhaps Zechariah had been silenced all this time so that Elizabeth could find her voice and her authority. I don't know. But what I do know is that once the child was named immediately, Zechariah's mouth was opened and his tongue was loosened and he began to praise God and pour out these words of incredible hope, casting this prophetic vision, not just over his child's life, but a prophetic vision for his whole people. He thanked God for being a God that fulfills promises and brings salvation and justice. He told everyone that his baby John, that he would be a prophet who would go before our God to prepare the way for the promised one. <coughs> Excuse me. That he would show the way to salvation. He told his people. <coughs> He told his people that his child would be the one to usher in the light. <coughs> we all need those moments of silence, huh? <coughs> he told his people <coughs> that his child would be the one to usher in the light light for those living in darkness <clears throat> and those living in the shadow of death and then he would guide their feet in the way of peace <clears throat> now it took the prayers of his whole community it took an encounter in the holy dark it took nine months of silence it took a baby wrapping his tiny fist around his finger. But eventually Zechariah found his way back from despair into a hope so deep and so wide that it overflowed. And Zechariah's child, he grew and became strong in spirit. And following his parents' example of silence and solitude and darkness and using those things to grow he lived out in the wilderness until it was time for him to follow his call, call to ministry. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Friends, let's take a moment of silence to digest our story.